First off, I'm Dr. William Curtis. For those of you who don't know me, I am a board-certified family physician. I'm the medical director of this clinic, which is Future Focus Family Medicine. Um, I am an author of a book called the NRG Diet Lifestyle Compass. It's kind of a general health guide. Uh, it doesn't just cover nutrition, it covers lifestyle, uh, things that affect our health in general. Uh, I also blog on a page called the nrgtribe.com. It's really my personal blog page that I kind of use to push ideas that I have about various medical problems. Um, and what I do is I use it as a reference point for my patients that I see. So instead of, you know, people ask, how do you do all this nutrition work with patients in 15 minutes in offices? And I say, well, I fudge that a little bit by pushing people to specific material so that we can educate them about certain things. This is the next level of that. We've done this before on and off in the past. I think it's very important that we outreach to the community because I think some of the ideas that I'm going to present today are probably things that um, don't sound like mainstream medicine, but I will assure you that this is something we do on a regular basis at this clinic, and the concepts I'm going to describe to you do work. Um, and I just I, I want this to be a normal platform that you can look forward to if you follow us on the clinic Facebook page at Future Focus uh, Facebook page, NRG Tribe. You can go to any of these resources, and you'll always be alerted to when we're having these types of events. If you can't make it, we'll also ultimately repost these. It won't be tonight because these have to be edited and everything, but these will go back out as references for you um, so you can kind of review what did he say about that. But I don't want you to leave without feeling like you got questions answered, okay? Because this is, this is kind of a passion of mine, uh, not just diabetes, but the things I'm going to talk about work well for all kinds of medical problems. The nutritional ideas and concepts I'm going to describe would work for autoimmune disorders, migraine problems, uh, weight loss, you name it, this same diet works well for that. Now this is specific for diabetics, type 2 diabetes first off, um, but I think this is something that you guys will get a value out of. I know several of you, uh, I've talked about some of these concepts, but I hope it'll hammer home um, a, a little bit clearer, and by all means ask your questions, okay? All right, so we're going to get started. We're going to talk about dietary therapy for type 2 diabetes. First concept I want you to understand is I want, I want to get you guys out of the mindset of thinking that we are going to treat symptoms of diabetes. Does anybody know at least one symptom of diabetes? Anybody? Excessive thirst. That's one. That's real bad. Yeah. And any others? Frequent urination. Frequent urination. Anybody else? Dizziness. Dizziness. High blood sugar, right? That's the one everybody knows, right? High blood sugar. Um, so type 2 diabetes um, is uh, got a whole ton of symptoms associated with it. Typically, we're going to see weight gain. Uh, typically, we're going to, if it's really uncontrolled, excessive thirst, frequency of urination, usually patients are going to notice fatigue. Uh, that's, a, that's a common one. Often frequent infections, things that they, uh, you know, most people don't get sick with, and skin infections, things like that. These are much, much more common in a type 2 diabetic because with high blood sugar and all the effects of insulin in the body, the immune system doesn't work as well. So there's all these complications of diabetes. Um, so the difference between what you're going to hear today, I'm going to make the case that insulin is the disease of type 2 diabetes, not sugar. Everybody knows about sugar. Let's check our sugar. What's our sugar? What's your A1C here? A1C, everybody know that's the average blood sugar? over the last three months. That's what we kind of measure. It's a good measurement. It gives us an idea of what's happening, but it isn't, um, it isn't particularly, I think in the big scheme of things, it isn't the most important thing. Okay? So insulin, I will say, is the disease of type 2 diabetes. Not sure. We'll get into that in much greater detail. So this picture shows a cascade of events that occur as a person over years develops type 2 diabetes. In the initial phases, um, I will make the case that sh consumption of simple sugars leads to greater quantities of simple sugars in the body that it has to deal with. Okay, make sense? As sugar rises, or as you consume sugar, the body absorbs it from the digestive tract, it gets pulled into the bloodstream, and then the body's smart and says, how do we get that into the cells? Because it doesn't automatically go to every cell in your body. We have to use a hormone called insulin that works like a lock and key. 
So what happens is, as the ins as the sugar rises in the bloodstream, because you just had a blizzard from you know whatever dairy queen or whatever, so you get a blizzard, your sugar goes up. What ends up happening is the li the insulin rises. The the pancreas creates it, releases it, and sugar is allowed into individual cells. Well, that's great. The first organ that does that is the liver, and it actually stores sugar. So that if you miss a meal for a day or 45 days, actually the liver will continue to deliver energy to the body. Okay. So I'm going to do a little demonstration so you understand. This is your liver. This is the rest of your body. This is, just think of food in the form of energy, simple sugars going into the body. So a blizzard or you know, a potato, some kind of simple sugar. As we pour this in, the liver stores as much as it possibly can. So it gets full. And as long as, you know, and you have to imagine, it's still burning sugar a little bit, so it's probably draining out ever so slow. If, I, if this is realistic, it would drain out a little bit, so we're using it. But as the years go on, and we keep putting simple sugars into the diet, and we'll describe those in later detail, and insulin keeps rising to keep that sugar down, something curious happens. The liver can no longer contain all of that sugar, it begins to lose its ability to store sugar, okay? So that begins to happen. So the liver can no longer store it. The muscles also do this and can no longer store enough. Your insulin levels have risen trying to put this stuff somewhere. So what happens is this sugar starts to spill over into the bloodstream. If the insulin level, if your body cannot raise insulin high enough to get that blood sugar into a cell somewhere in your body or stored as fat in the midsection, which is what it primarily does, then it spills over and we start to see signs or symptoms of diabetes, high blood sugar, okay? So this is the sugar flowing out of the liver, overspilling, and, and you're starting to notice that on blood sugar tests, okay? So just a visual of that process. So that brings us to insulin increases to lower this blood sugar. But the body has only so much capability of creating insulin. And if it can't create enough, it actually becomes the problem. Insulin is a hormone like other hormones in the body. Testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, all of these different hormones. The more you have of a single hormone in the body, the more effect it exerts. But hormones are interesting. I like to say they're like, uh, the, you know, the kids have these bouncy houses, right? The, the little float, you know, they blow them up and the kids bounce around. Well, there's always this one really big kid that, or the older kid that shouldn't be in there, right? And he comes in and he jumps. Boom! He hits the deck and there are all the little kids go flying. That's what happens with hormones, especially when we add hormones or we stimulate a situation that causes a hormone to be way higher balance than it ever was meant to be in the body. Did everybody follow me to this point? Okay. So I'm going to make the case that insulin becomes the disease because we know a lot of things about insulin. Insulin causes us to gain weight in our midsection. If anyone has weight in their midsection or belly fat, that is a sign of high insulin. You don't have to run a test to know that. It's, it's a fact. If it's going down, then your insulin levels are going down. And we can measure this, but that is a, you know, a direct indicator. Um, insulin is a pro-inflammatory hormone. So that's why when insulin is high, like we've said in diabetics, like two diabetics, they're more prone to heart attacks. They're more prone to autoimmune disorders. They're more prone to all types of inflammatory disorders of the body. Nowadays, uh, does anybody know what they, the term type 3 diabetes means? Anybody have any guess on that one? Including Alzheimer's. Their type 3 diabetes is another, another name for Alzheimer's disease. Okay. So they're starting to see that Alzheimer's is uh, the damage that goes on in the brain is basically looks very similar to the damage that goes on in the rest of the body in a diabetic. 
So what we're thinking is that some of the some of the researchers with Alzheimer's is that they believe that Alzheimer's is basically diabetes of the central nervous system. So it's a more isolated version. Um, and that's why people with type 2 diabetes have a much higher rate of dementia and Alzheimer's disease as well. So again, it boils down to insulin. Insulin is inflammatory. They've had uh, studies in animals, dog studies, where they took a vessel, an artery, and a leg, and they isolated it. They, while it's still in the animal, they isolate it, and they run insulin through it. Just pass it through there. Within a few doses, there's already vascular calcifications and plaque formation in the artery suggestive of coronary or artery disease. Insulin alone did that. So these are all interesting findings. So I mentioned here insulin as it elevates, as it stays high, because we ha it has to stay high, because we're consuming, we're pouring the same thing in. The liver can only contain so much. As insulin rises, we gain weight in the midsection. That's why a characteristic finding of a type 2 diabetic is weight, uh, weight gain, midsection, weight gain, and we'll also go over a few other items that it will lead to. <coughs> so how does this begin? It starts with genetics. That's not completely clear. Let me see if I can clear that up just a time. Maybe it's just me being blind tonight. So we all have a certain genetic, you know, genetic propensity for this. Um, and then there's diet. We all start with that. We have choices. Okay? There's a lot of folks, Hispanics, Blacks, Native Americans are all much higher incidence of type 2 diabetes just genetically. Just, just the way they're made. But it takes a series of things to cause that to be expressed. That's called epigenetics. In other words, the recent, the most recent research in medicine is starting to do what they call epigenetic studies. And what that means is your genes express differently depending on what, what impacted the environment, the nutrition, injuries, drugs, chemicals, pesticides, all these things interact with our, our genetics and they can express one condition or another. So genetics plus diet, we all start there. If we eat excessive processed carbohydrates, and we will go through this, what that is, that begins to lead to what we've been talking about, elevated insulin, that it leads to weight gain. Weight gain then leads to other findings that we see in the bloodstream, sugar, high cholesterol, in particular, high triglycerides and low HDL, which is the good cholesterol. So we start to see this particular pattern in diabetics on their cholesterol profiles. We also see it in pre-diabetics. This is an area, once we get down here, where this is going on long enough, we get down to where elevation in insulin becomes, a, and you have these features, we begin to call that insulin resistance, or metabolic syndrome, or as my former attending at University of Texas uh, in San Antonio, uh, Alba Franzo, he actually wrote the book on this, um, calls it metabolic syndrome, syndrome X. He's the guy that came up with that term. And once we have this, you must realize we're not a diabetic yet. The sugar hasn't spilled over to the point where it measures greater than 6.5 on the hemoglobin A1C, or an average sugar greater than 126, so it's not quite diabetes. Interesting though, okay, why do I care? I'm, this, uh, diabetic, I'm not a diabetic, I, was, I must be in the wrong room, right? People with this condition have the same risk factor for heart disease as a full-blown diabetic. So once these symptoms are already there, the horse is out of the barn already. It's already, it's already a problem. And we should already be doing something about it. Once it's here, yeah, you still obviously at the risk. All the things that we hear about diabetics. But pre-diabetics, metabolic syndrome, syndrome X, insulin resistance, pre-diabetes, whatever you want to call it, it's all the same thing, has the same risk. So then if this goes on and we ignore it, we don't choose to treat why it's happening, or worse, we treat the symptoms, <clears throat> we, give, we start to see very high blood sugars. And then all those things we talked about, frequency of urination, um, you know, thirst, high blood sugars, all these things become very, very prominent for the patient when they present to us. So that's diabetes. I've got a question yes. about your, your liver there. Yes. Do you ever get to the point, if you read correctly, that your liver will correct itself? I believe it does. And the reason is, it's, to be totally accurate, there needs to be a little a valve at the bottom of this, because you're burning sugar all day long. Right? You are burning sugar. You're burning energy. So really, this is happening all day long. So. We'll get to that, and that's, I probably will have a whole nother lecture on intermittent fasting and various things like that, 
but we will cover that to some extent because you're using this. But if you keep, the point I'll make today is if you keep putting something in, this process never goes away. It always stays there and you get the same consequences. So I'm going to introduce this concept called diabetic remission. Uh, I did a, we'll, if you're interested, we can email you a link. You might have already heard this, but Jimmy Moore does a, uh, does a thing called uh, Living the Vita Low Carb. Uh, I did a, about an hour and a half interview with him one time on my experience as a primary care physician treating diabetics in this county, which is the highest rate of diabetes in the state of Texas. Um, we talked about diabetic remission, and we talked exactly about what we're talking about tonight. Diabetic remission is a, a term that I use to describe not having di type 2 diabetes, and it doesn't mean you're taking medications, because this is not the cure. Nutrition ends up being the cure, and I'll go through what the exact definition is. I mean that you're, when I, to define diabetic remission, I mean that the insulin has normalized. We're losing body fat percentage in the midsection. We could measure a lower insulin level. The A1C, which is the average blood sugar test, has normalized. It is now in the non-diabetic range. The patient has eliminated all diabetic medications. That, that does happen. Triglycerides and HDL cholesterol also improve because if we're doing the things that would improve that, this type stuff goes away. Patients with fatty liver, by the way, this is fatty liver. That's what, that's what that condition is, everything I just did there. And all these changes are improved by diet and lifestyle. And we're going to go through what that is, specific nutritional changes. A lot of times people talk about nutrition and they say, well, I, I try to eat well. I hear this all day. You know, I try to eat well. Or I do pretty good. Uh, and now I'll pin them down. What do you eat? And then we go through the nitty gritty details. The devil's in the details with this. And there are going to be specific things that I spell out that make a difference. This is a controversial topic, the, top, the idea of diabetic remission. Um, basically, I'm talking about curing diabetes. There are lots of doctors much smarter than myself that are talking about this on very large scales. Uh, books have been written for the last 10 years on this very topic. Uh, Rosedale, um, heck, Dr. Atkins back in the day, back in the 70s and 80s, was talking about similar things. Um, many in the paleo dieting movement have talked about this type of thing, Rob Wolf and these types of books, um, and others. Um, a couple that I really like is a, a, a doctor named Jason Fang um, and also Dr. Bullock. These are all names of people that are talking along these lines. But when you, out as a layperson, trying to get medical care and get the best thing you can for your condition, you're going to run into you're going to run into people who think this is baloney. Okay? And I have colleagues of mine that say I'm full of BS. Okay. This is because of several things. I, I actually have, I used to be very, uh, anxious is not the word, I used to be self-conscious about this idea. I'm not self-conscious about it anymore because I see it all the time. I see the improvements that people have. So it doesn't matter what a colleague down the street that doesn't know this or doesn't care to learn, it doesn't matter to me. I, I don't worry because I know I'm helping people. Part of the problem is we look at the body separately. If you can see this little cartoon, you know, this is the GI guy, this is the lung doctor, this is the heart doctor. This is traditional Western medicine. We are taught that the body is in systems, they're independent. You have a lung problem. You do not have a, you know, gut problem. So you must see the lung doctor. He must decide what to do. Um, but there's other problems. So this, it's a concept that this is an entire whole body system. This also, the idea I'm going to teach you also implies that you believe, or I believe, that you should believe that your body knows how to fix itself. If I come cut you, your body it heals itself, right? Mm -hmm. Mostly, right? So it seems self-evident that the body knows how to heal itself. It has some kind of blueprint that knows how to do that. It's pretty smart. Is everybody with me on that? So we'll start with that premise, okay? So the controversy of a topic like diabetic remission stems from pharmaceutical industries. It is absolutely not in their best interest um, to tell people to eat differently um, because they sell medications that lower sugar. We just talked about how sugar isn't even the problem. Insulin is the problem. But we feel better and our numbers look a little bit better, so we feel better when our sugars are better. And so this is whole industry based on sugar metabolism and how to lower it. And we give people insulin. 
Yes, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But the bottom line is, pharmaceutical ind industries are very powerful. They dictate and work with other industries we'll talk about on what patients are told, especially government entities, and how we as physicians practice medicine and what you do about it. If you don't think they do, they do because of the bottom one down here, insurance and insurance of payers. How many of you ever had to go to the pharmacy and go, I'm not paying for that prescription? That's way too high, right? Right? So you just didn't buy it. Okay. You chose not to buy it, but they also curbed you to do something else. They save money. <coughs> they, they dictated to you what to do. So that's how insurance payers, government funding programs, that's another big one. So when you look at just basic things like cholesterol management from the you know 1940s, Ansel Keys, right? This guy was a researcher that looked at cholesterol and how it relates possibly to heart disease. He convinced enough congressmen, and there's, there's, you can watch this on YouTube, he convinced enough congressmen that he saw that there was a link between high cholesterol and heart disease. So the higher the cholesterol, the more likely you're gonna have a heart attack. They voted to change the food pyramid so that we eat tons of grains, you know, uh, whole grain cereals and all these things. Um, and the entire country changed its thought process over the years based on Congress voting on a food pyramid. You know, they always get it right, right? <laughs> so this has happened, and now these government entities don't change rapidly over time. So even if they know that there's new research, with their, which there is, they're still, they're still teaching some of the same things that we've been saying for the last 40 years since Ansel Keys, 50 years now. The problem is Ansel Keys, his research, and just I'm not kind of sidebarring on, on cholesterol, but he actually didn't use all the data he had available. He forgot about the French, he forgot about the Swedish, and the Finns, and numerous other countries that have extremely high fat diets, have extremely high cholesterol uh, in their general population, and have extremely low heart disease. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't fit. But it's the law in ethics. It's, it's the rule. It's what we've been taught. And generations of physicians are taught the same thing. And they don't. And this is another reason, culturally, amongst physicians, healthcare providers, this is not culturally normal to talk about some of the things I'm talking about today. Medical industries. Oh boy, how much are those test strips? Anybody know? Pretty expensive. Test strips. Yeah, they're expensive. The meters are free. The test strips that'll get you, right? So there's entire industries built on managing diabetes. Not treating it, managing it. Not curing it, managing it. That's one of the things that I think is a hindrance to curing type 2 diabetes. Food industries. I always have to take a deep breath on this one because I, this, I get, anybody walk through Walmart and gotten angry at the fact that every time you turn around, including the shoe aisle, to the shoe aisle. There are buckets of candy, candy, pastries, Pop-Tarts, stuff that isn't even really food. It's like some kind of colored sugar substance. Don't forget the lady handing out their Oh yeah, cereal. would you like a Snickers bar with that? They're two for one. You never know. I don't want a Snickers bar. You want to stop? You just say that for my kid. Thank you very much. Yeah. So the point is, food industries. I don't know how many of you know this, but food industries employ scientists that measure exact chemicals, salts, sugar, prescriptions, if you will, in food that you cannot resist. Sugar is addicting, especially in certain, certain um, concentrations. It's certainly also whenever there's specific combinations of fat with it. So these are things that, that they know, and I know that they manipulate us that way. So I'm kind of, I'm really anti-food industry in a lot of ways because mm -hmm. you have entire industries that built and funded, by the way, the food pyramid and all that other stuff. Let's don't get into the Congress again. But that that whole the whole grain industry that produces these simple sugars and stuff, it's all one big system. So this all sounds kind of tinfoil hat kind of stuff, but if you dig around a little bit, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to derail anymore on this, there's a lot of evidence this is, this is um, why this topic, like, hey, let's cure diabetes with nutrition, why that seems so strange to most people. It's not mainstream. I made the point earlier, genes don't cause diabetes. <clears throat> we'll come back to that. 
Genes plus your environment is what causes diabetes. Food is the primary one, and we'll get into details. Chemicals. Inside of every soda, soda can actually, there's a hormone, uh, not hormone, a chemical called BPA. Big long name, but BPA. It's a lining that keeps the contents of the drink from interacting with the metal in the can. BPA um, is an independent risk factor for obesity. And it is a known risk factor for obesity in children because it's the only source they can get it from. It's from canned goods, um, chemicals. If that trace little chemical plastic compound in a bottle can do this, there are tons of other chemicals in our, in our food chain that can do the same thing. Medications. There are actually medications that are extremely common that make you more prone to diabetes. Uh, right off the top of my head, antipsychotic medications. They have black box warnings on them that say warning will cause uh, diabetes. Um, statin drugs, cholesterol medications have been shown to raise the uh, blood sugar, and they have also been shown to increase the incidence of type 2 diabetes, but we're all supposed to be on okay, it. So um, beta blockers, common, common uh, blood pressure medication, tends to raise blood sugars, tends to make people more prone to developing type 2 diabetes. Those are just a few. Hormones. Growth hormone is a common ingredient in milk, because it was added to the cow to make it produce more milk. It's uh, commonly given in some, I think it's less common nowadays, but traditionally uh, we have been eating beef that has been given certain hormones. That's becoming very unpopular now. So fortunately, maybe our food chain's getting a little better, but the hormones that are in our foods transmit through the food and actually affect our body. Every kind of notice, it seems like, like 10 year old girls now are developing a lot, like a lot faster. My daughter started developing that one. Yeah. I believe this is partially why that's happening. Now, I'll also side rail on that. We talked about insulin being the disease. When you eat simple sugar, insulin rises. Insulin also triggers fat storage. It also triggers growth hormone and all these other things that may cascade imbalances in the female or male endocrine system, which lead to premature puberty and all these other things. So hormones. Stress, injury. When you have a uh, high stress, like life is stressful all the time, right? Modern life. Well, if you're under stress all the time, your liver, uh, sorry, your adrenal glands create cortisol, which is stress hormone. Stress hormone rises, tells the liver, you better don't sugar into the bloodstream because we're getting ready to fight for our lives. Unfortunately, it's just your boss yelling at you, right? So then what ends up happening, sugar rises. What happens? What happens next? Insulin rises. Insulin rises. Bingo. And so rises, we store weight in our midsection. So we're stressed out, middle-aged with the belly fat, right? That's what ends up happening with chronic stress. Well, you do that long enough, it causes the same cycle. Physical activity plays a big role. Um, if you're inactive, obviously you're burning less, less coming out of the body. You're more prone to developing diabetes. If you have the genetics for it, I'll sidebar here. If you don't have the genetics, what happens to you if you eat poorly and have all these issues? Maybe. Other people get heart disease. You ever seen skinny people that get heart attacks? You ever seen people that uh, have autoimmune disorders, psoriasis, all those kind of things? That's a different genetics, same diet. I don't, you know. So tips for achieving diabetic remission. We'll get in, we're getting into the nuts and bolts here. You need to fuel the body differently. That's diet. We'll cover that. I believe, and these are a little bit pet peeves of mine, but you've got to take responsibility for your own health. Do not look at me to cure you. Do not look at your specialists. Do not look at anyone else but yourself to decide whether you can make yourself better. That's kind of seems self-evident, but don't accept conditioned behavior. Thanksgiving's coming up. We're all supposed to pig out. We're supposed to eat until we can't move, lay around nauseous while we're watching the Cowboys play. This is the cultural norm, right? We should not do this. We should not subject ourselves to that. Now, hey, enjoy a nice meal. And if you want, have a piece of pumpkin pie. But I'm going to lay out the case that what you do every day is what matters, what you do most of the time matters. And don't accept that you have to be a conditioned, oh, this is what we all do. This is what we have to do. Well, my whole family does that. We always, food is very tied to cultural norms. Mm -hmm. It's hard to break from that. 
is you got to think about what is this what is this doing to me. Challenge yourself, build new habits. I, I think having a growth mindset is very important for what I'm teaching tonight. Be active. Human beings were meant to move 12 miles a day. We were meant to run around the savannas chasing small game, wearing them out, and then crushing them with a rock. Okay? That's what we were meant to do. So we have good stamina, we can run miles, we're fast, and we still have explosive power to finish whatever we need to do. But we have to be active. We can't sit in front of a computer all day. I'm going to give you an example, and then we're going to go into the actual nutrition. This is Jose. This is an actual patient. He actually doesn't mind if I shared his whole story, but I, I'm going to, for privacy, I won't tell you more. He is 42. Um, he is a type 2 diabetic. He had been a diabetic for three years. Over the last couple of years, his A1C had ranged from as high as 11.2, which means his tenure expected survival, based on that number, is about uh, 20%. Okay? That's what that number means. And it had been as good as 7.7 .7 with medications. He was on three medications to get it to 7.7. .7. So his sugar was better, right? His weight maxed out at 251 on all these medications, and his BMI ballooned to morbidly obese 40.5. He had evidence of diabetic nephropathy, which means his kidneys were showing signs of injury related to diabetes. He also had a high blood pressure. I mentioned the kidney disease. He was tired all the time, low sex drive. Uh, very overweight, and he had high cholesterol, high triglycerides, all the things that we talked about before. Interestingly, he was always foggy, too. I'll, I'll just off the slide here, but he was always, like, when you talk to him, he was just like, oh, what? You know, he's just, when you're talking to him, he, he wasn't sharp. I asked him on day one, I need you to change your diet. He drinks sodas every day, and he drank beer on a regular basis. And I told him, I want you to remove liquid, simple sugars from your diet. That's it, step one remove liquid simple sugars. So he stopped drinking soda on a daily basis and he stopped drinking three or four beers a day. He also, I told him, I need you to get your machine removing and I want you to go walk. He said, it doesn't have to be excessive, but I want you to walk four days a week. Pretty simple, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, he did. In 90 days, three months, this gentleman lost 43 pounds. Uh, his BMI dropped from 40 to 32. Blood pressure normalized to 120. Remember, he was had high blood pressure. He had, I stopped two diabetic medicines because he kept calling me saying, I keep getting low blood sugar spells. What do I do? And I said, well, I'm, I'm trying to kill you with this diabetic medicine, so I think I'll just stop it. How's that? He had great energy. He came in, and he had actually started working out really vigorously. He started running bleachers and doing all this other stuff because he felt so good. Increased sex drive, which was big plus. So that he didn't say much about that the first go around, but he comes back and now he's got great sex drive. Mood was good and he said, my sleep is great. And his mind and his how he behaved was so much sharper. He was awake. His brain was on toxic and blood sugar. So here are the rules, dietarily speaking. You need to eat more of these foods. The first of which is non-starchy vegetables. Uh, seven to nine servings, if you have to have a number, would be a number that says, I'm eating a lot of non-starchy vegetables. Seven to nine would be two to three per meal. Or a big salad might count. Basically, a serving is about the size of your fist. So that can be a large salad, a couple of sides, you know, you figure that out. You need to try to eat local. So you should try to get something local, do the best you can with that, maybe a farmer's market. You need to try to eat seasonal, which means eat foods that are in season for the most part. You need to eat more grass-fed proteins. Now, not more, but at least a steady amount, okay? These things might be grass-fed beef, lamb, wild game of various deer season, all that kind of thing, Oregon meats, poultry, eggs. These are all things that are okay. I heard that eating eggs is gonna have high cholesterol, please. 2014, they proved that eating cholesterol doesn't raise the cholesterol for 75% of the population. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Quality fats, that's number three, very important. Because if you start cutting simple sugars, your blood sugar will start swinging around. It might go lower. You might feel a little like, hey, I'm feeling different. Eating quality fats like coconut oil, extra virgin olive oil, sesame seeds, flax, avocado, dark chocolate, that means 75% chocolate. chocolate. Uh, fish oils, nuts, chia seeds, these are all foods that help stabilize blood sugar by giving you an even source of energy that isn't sugar. It isn't doing this, it's doing this. It's not going into the liver and causing the overflow sugar problem. Full fat milk, uh, cultured fat dairy. And this would be things like yogurt, buttermilks, buttercream. 
I caution you with these if you have any allergies, asthma, or sensitivities, digestive problems. Dairy is not something I teach people to eat a ton of, but it is a good food, it is a good source of fat, but not if you have extreme blood sugar problems, so I put some warnings on those, okay? Homemade bone broths, we'll come back to that, and fermented vegetables, condiments, and even drinks like kombucha. Anybody familiar with you know this type of food? Fermented foods? So from the dawn of man, we fermented stuff, we let bacteria sort of uh, kind of uh, digest the simple sugars inside of the foods we eat. So this is where sauerkraut, kimchi, kombucha, the traditional ketchup, all of these things were made from as sour pickled foods. They're good for you. You should eat a lot of them. So meats, fresh vegetables, these are local, seasonal. Eggs, preferably pasture raised, something that wasn't grown in a little cage and you know didn't move around anywhere. So we should eat less of these. Didn't say none, but less. Starchy vegetables, white potatoes, corn. White potatoes are not your friend. Okay, white potatoes in my mind just don't count it as a vegetable. Just don't eat it. Okay, especially if you're diabetic. Natural sweeteners, honey, coconut, nectar. I, this really bothers people when I say this. Honey is still a simple sugar. Yeah, it's better than eating high fructose corn syrup. Okay, but it's still and it has medicinal properties. I know, I know. All <coughs> But it's still a simple sugar. If you're diabetic, it's going to make your insulin higher. It's going to cause the disease to be worse. Fruit. I put it in italics because if you want to have a sprinkle of a berry and a shake or something, probably not the end of the world. But you really, sugar has fructose in it, and it is one of the hardest sugars for the body to digest. I would never drink fruit juice, never. Orange juice is not healthy. Apple juice is not healthy. Don't let your kids drink it. You don't drink it. It's concentrated crack for the liver. Okay, it is not. It's not helpful. Sugar, uh, <coughs> apple juice, and orange juice have higher glycemic indexes than Coca-Cola. So it's worse than drinking Coca-Cola. Uh, I, this is a fine point, uh, but factory raised, chemically processed foods, eggs and poultry that are grown in big farms that chemically manhandled and everything. Try to stay, try to eat local with your local growers and stuff. You'll be healthier for that. Okay, here's the big one. Eat none of these. So we've tapered down. Now we're at the, the stuff that everybody gets up and leaves, right? <laughs> so the big one at the top, there is a priority list of these. Everything I do is a priority. Liquid sugars are the big one. Uh, you must not drink sodas, fruit juices, sweet teas, monster drinks, beer, wine, and hard liquor. Now, if you want to have a a, lick, a, a, a drink occasionally, like a couple times a month or something. I'm not going to fault you with that if you if you've done all the other steps. But generally, beer is just as bad as sodas or fruit juice. Eat drinking consistently week after week. I'm not going to get into all those details. Is not a good thing, and it is one of the primary reasons people are diabetics. Packaged foods: chips, cookies, cakes, candy, crackers, microwave meals, and packaged sauces. Be careful with these things because a lot of the packaged sauces. You know, oh, I'll just use my you know, Chef Boyardee mix or whatever. A lot of this have a lot of sugar in it. Um, white flour, bread, tortillas, pasta, rolls, biscuits, donuts, pastries, and pretzels. These are foods that are just pure, turn into simple sugar, and it just keeps happening. Refined sugar, obvious. Blood sugar, glucose, dextrose, high fructose corn syrup. Uh, these are all versions. Anytime you see these on the or if you don't understand what the name is on the back of it, don't eat it. <laughs> so artificial sweeteners, Splenda, Sweet and Low, Saccharin, Aspartame, Sucralose, Neotene. Um, basically, see how does this go? The pink one causes cancer. The blue one has been proven, no, sorry. The blue one causes cancer. The pink packet is more addicting than crack cocaine. The yellow packet causes diarrhea. So pick your poison. The one I will tell uh, diabetics if they feel like they have to have some sweet is uh, um, stevia. Stevia. Oh. stevia is not a sugar, it's an herb. Uh, okay, so technically you could use that and it doesn't drive your blood sugars. Um, stevia. stevia. Oh. It's a green, I think they have it in a little green packet. Yeah. Just must. Boxed cereals, any kind, doesn't matter. Oh, I thought Wheaties is good. Or, no, no, just don't, don't use cereals. Uh, that also includes, I'm not a big oatmeal fan. Oatmeal is a simple sugar. Soy products are estrogen-based compounds. I generally avoid soy. And then white rice. 
okay? Uh, there's some subtleties in some other brown rice and all these others, but white rice is definitely avoided, and generally what rice is a grain, generally you're gonna avoid grains. So this includes wheat, sugars, right? These are all the kind of packaged grain foods. Superfoods, these would be things, hey, all, you know, they don't look traditional to most of you, uh, maybe some of you. Butter, ghee, which is a, which is a version of butter. Uh, especially from animals growing in rapidly growing green pastures, these animals produce a very, very high quality butter. Eggs from pasture raised chickens, ducks, turkeys, quail that eat natural diets that aren't being fed things that have hormones and pesticides and herbicides in it. This is preferred because that ends up in your meat. <clears throat> Bone broth. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say especially fasting days because probably one of these days if you guys are interested, um, I will talk about intermittent fasting in great detail as well. There will be more on that. Organ meats. We don't traditionally eat these in the United States. Not, not anymore. But liver, heart, kidney. All these kind of things, people don't eat them anymore. In all traditional cultures, those are eaten first. Red meat, cuts of limbs and things off of animals is the last thing that's eaten. Look at Hispanic cultures, with you got menudo and they got all these organ meats. Uh, in Europe, you know, it's the uh, kidney pies and mincemeat pies and all these kind of things. Uh, somehow we made that sweet here in the US. Ever had a mincemeat pie? I'm not sure, and it's weird. But usually the traditional were just chopped up and super spicy, all these organ meats. And the reason is this is the densest portion of nutrients in the form of minerals, vitamins, good fats, all the things that we need to repair our bodies. But it's not the norm now, you gotta look for this stuff. Fermented fish oils are good for you as well. That would be things like cod liver oil, tuna oil. So you're saying menudo's good? What's up? What was that? I said you're saying menudo's good? Yeah, I love it. It's an organ meat, or it's an organ. It doesn't have a ton of carbohydrates. It does have a little lahominy, which is a kind of a, a little bit of a starchy kind of grain type thing. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with that, especially the meat, the the, the tripe. So we'll kind of sum this up. Where do we start? Avoid liquid sugars. Okay, that's the big one. If you just got to say where do I start somewhere, just don't do those. And then you got the details on the others. Consider a dietary cleanse, and I'm going to cover that briefly in the next section. We'll, Take a couple questions here and then we'll, and we'll do the cleanse talk. And then step three, and I put an asterisk by it because I think we're going to come back to that at some point in the future and do a talk specifically on intermittent fasting as it relates to diabetes, which is for my patients that are on insulin. By the way, there's a way off of insulin, uh, but it's going to involve some intermittent fasting. Uh, these are probably on your handouts, but Energy Tribe, it, these are ways to reach uh, our informational site, and there is also specific information for diabetics on here, okay? So I think that's the end of those slides, and we'll jump straight over to the other one, and we can wrap this one up here. So if you have been listening to this, and you say, okay, man, he just gave me a lot of, um, gave me a lot of details here, and I'm not sure where to start, that type of thing. I'm going to give you one example of something you can do that will at least jumpstart this process. Okay, this is a cleanse program. It's a something that Standard Process came up with, which was a kind of vitamin whole food supplement manufacturer. They came up with this plan that gives you information: what to eat, what not to eat. You got a, you got part of the handout right now. It's got the foods, do's and don'ts, and you'll notice that that carefully mimics what I just told you. But there's also uh, in that, um, that you will see that there's a detoxification agents that detox the body and help you with sugar handling, uh, and also uh, a, a whole list of things to do for 10 days that gets you a little sample and a path to follow to get started down this road that I just told you. So that's what we're going to talk about just probably the next 10 minutes. Um, I firmly believe this. Uh, that's from Sligo, Ireland. I took a walk in the park there or walk in the forest. Um, people think this is not possible, but it is. But you have to do something different than you've traditionally done. You have to do something different if you want a different result. We did the slide, so I'm not going to go through this. But also another way of looking at it, we talked about how diet, lifestyle, and environment affect our genetics and leads to um, the situation with either health or disease. That's where they meet. We've covered that. We've covered that. If anybody has finished their uh, symptom survey, the symptoms in, did I say group three? Yeah, group three. Group three 
um, is where you will see most of the symptoms that even if you're not a diabetic, if you have a lot of symptoms in group three, these are the things that a, a program, a detox program, a 10 day blood sugar cleanse, these are the things that often get massively better in a very quick period of time. So things like heart palpitations, eating when nervous, excessive appetite, irritable, anybody ever get hangry? Like so hungry that they're just kind of, that's called, you know, that's, that's a blood sugar or something. Uh, craving something, coffee, candy, it's craving. That's a blood sugar handling issue. So if you light up like a Christmas tree when you fill this out in that section, this is a sign that even if you're not a diabetic, if you're pre-diabetic, you might be non-diabetic and have these symptoms, and that's a sign that you should be considering how to detox yourself from sugar. So the 10-day blood sugar program is, like I said, it's just something to get you started. It's a trick. I call it a trick because I want you to be tricked into saying, yeah, I can follow anything for 10 days. And then you realize once you do it that you feel good, and you can actually, you can, and then you'll ask me, what do I do? We'll continue. And then we've already talked about some of the ways you would continue that. First thing, sounds very similar to what I just said. No grains, bread, cereal, oatmeal, cookies, pastries, crackers. Avoid processed starches, no chips, ice cream, candy. Eliminate sodas. We talked about that with beverages, alcohol. Limit caffeine. The supplement regimen is a series of four. These are done for 10 to 14 days typically, and I'll go through kind of typically what they do. But the supplements are de designed to help you with the process of pulling yourself off of simple sugars that you might be eating routinely that you don't are not going to be happy about removing from your diet. This will help you weather that storm. It sometimes comes. And these foods obviously are not on the diet, including Homer Simpson's beer. <laughs> this is to remind me that medications, your requirement for medications on a program like this can change. And if you notice I'm checking my sugars, I'm doing my 10 day cleanse, and I feel shaky and my sugar is 70, it's possible you might not need your medication. Certainly, if we're your, if we're your physician, send us a message. We'll give you advice. But it's okay to skip a dose if that's what you had to do that day. And then if that keeps happening and you're still in good shape without the medicine, that's that's a, just be aware that that can happen. You've got a hand. And Jill, they have the the handout. Is that the nutritional slide? Is that yeah, y'all have that? Okay. I'm not going to go through that, but that is a just down and dirty. You can look at it and say these are foods that I can eat. Okay. These would be things that you can't eat, and I think you've all got a copy of that or some version of it. You've got a version of it. It's not identical to this one. This is the four products that are on this that you would take for a very short period of time, 10 to 14 days. This is not, you don't do this like forever. The first sit on the left is SP Complete. It's a protein shake. It does have vitamins and minerals in it, but it gives you a protein source while you're doing this. Because what this program will ask you to do is it'll say, get these simple sugars out and eat this way. Eat these kind of foods. And when you do that, you're gonna, you might need a little extra protein. You might need to, you might want some extra vitamins and minerals that you're probably deficient in. That helps. So it can be used as a protein shake if you want to give them samples of that. SP Cleanse is actually a product that Standard Process uses. I use it a lot with my patients as a detox agent. It's an herbal remedy. It has multiple, multiple ingredients that are designed to detox the liver, which is one of the organs we've been talking about. <laughs> it has ingredients that detox the kidney, the colon, uh, skin. And uh, it's very safe, but it gets taken in large doses because usually people that have high glycemic problems, blood sugar problems, usually have other toxicities as well. So this helps clean you. It's not like, it doesn't clean you up violently, like you're going to have to be hanging by the commode all day long or something. That's not what this does. But it does, you will notice things. You will notice your, maybe your skin smells a little different, your stools are a little different. It does detox you. Um, I know urine usually smells different whenever you do this because it helps your body cleanse things up. Very natural, works well. Diaplex. Uh, Diaplex is a kind of a mineral support. Um, it helps smooth out blood sugar handling issues in your body. Um, it provides multiple minerals and vitamins that a diabetic would need. It's chromium, various things like that that we've all kind of probably read about. Little things that tend to help with diabetes. Diaplex is a one product that has a lot of that in it. A lot of my diabetics actually continue to use these latter two supplements I'm showing here. And Gymnema is the last one. I'll cover that in a little bit more detail. So SP Complete is like a shake. It's a powdered shake. And I think she's got a few samples she made 
just a, uh, it looks blue. Yes, it has a fruit in it. It has blueberries. It had like a couple of blueberries in it. It's not a high sugar drink, but that's an example of one if you want to try it. Um, it also contains kelp, alfalfa, buckwheat. These are things that have 90 trace minerals, which is in diabetics, multiple diabetics have many trace mineral deficiencies. Uh, I'll skip through this. The cleanse we talked about. Cells become toxic. They don't communicate properly with each other whenever insulin levels are extremely high and when blood sugar is high. This product is the one that helps uh, cleanse those organs. has various ingredients in it like juniper, red clover, uh, burdock. These are all herbs that are safe um, but also uh, tend to uh, improve and detox the bloodstream. Diaplex we talked about. Gymnema is also known, this is an herb. So this last product is uh, known in Hindu cultures as the sugar destroyer. Um, it has been traditionally known that it, it can actually, when taken as an herb, it can make your tongue numb to the flavor of, or the taste of sugar. So one of the tricks I've done with people is I have them get a tablet, put it on their tongue when they have a bad craving, they just can't taste the sugar anymore. So <laughs> that's kind of a trick, but it also lowers sugars. Now I cut a bunch of slides out of this, but there was a whole series of slides, kind of medical slides, that show research on how gymnema will actually lower blood sugar over time. So it is much like a drug would lower blood sugar. It will do that as well if taken consistently over time. You tend to notice lower blood sugar. This has been used for over 2,000 years. People that do the 10-day cleanse routinely, we ha we've had seminars where this is all we talked about was this program. People who have done this will almost universally note greater energy. Many of them have weight loss for all the reasons we've talked about, insulin, sugar, all these things. Decreased belly fat, insulin. Decreased blood sugar, um, lower triglycerides, massively lower on this particular detox, and improved cholesterol profile. So if you're suffering with any of these things, any of these issues, it helps. Symptoms, improved digestion. It, it detoxes the body. You're off of things that uh, feed the wrong bacteria in your gut. Decreased migraine headaches, less allergy symptoms, improved sleep, improved mood, PMS is even better. There's a lot of things that get tremendously better with this particular program, even when done just for a short period of time. Medical conditions, weight loss, blood pressure, cholesterol, adrenal fatigue, topic for another day, uh, hormone imbalances, circulation disorders, emotional problems. I'll t I always share the story real quick. Had a girl come in, she was probably, I say she's a girl, she's probably like 28, 29 years old. Um, first meeting, Friday afternoon, I was running late, it's like 5.30, and when I walk in the room, I can tell something's bad wrong. This patient is severely depressed. As I started taking my history, I realized she was suicidal. Uh, I was kind of worried. I thought, first off, you know, selfishly, I'm like, it's 5.30. <laughs> you know, like, of course it's Friday and at 5.30, I'm going to have this kind of case. But then I thought, okay, what can I do for this lady? So I took a, like I normally do, a social history, and I always ask about nutrition. So somewhere in the middle of her history, she says, she's sobbing through her story, she says, I drink, a, I drink 10 to 12 Dr. Peppers a day. Oh. I thought, wow, that's really a lot, you know. I mean, I've heard of a beer, you know, 12 pack a day, but not, not 12 Dr. Peppers a day, like, golly, you know. So anyway, I, I kind of hooked onto that. I thought, you know, I counseled her a little bit. I gave her the numbers to the suicide hotline and all the things I could do at that hour of the day. And I said, look, rather than send you to the hospital, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to promise me you're not gonna drink any more sodas at all. And I need you to come back and see me in two weeks. And if you're, at any time, you think you're gonna hurt yourself, you're gonna go and you're gonna call this number and you go. And the reason I did that, she had no reason to be depressed. Hey, do you have a relationship problem? No. Financially you okay? No. Yeah. Nobody's hurting you or threatening you or oh, you're not doing drugs and you know whatever. No. What's wrong with this person? She comes back in two weeks, I kid you not. She lost eight pounds. She's already thin, but she lost eight pounds. Her skin color was different. Not depressed. Clearly not depressed. And her first thing is thank you so much for not putting me on an antidepressant. I was so worried you were gonna do that. And I didn't realize it, but I caught stop drinking the sodas, I feel completely different. It was poisoning her. Okay? So emotional imbalances. And also, by the way, a lot of folks with uh, anxiety, stuff like that, a lot of these are driven by sugar metabolism. Heart disease, uh, heart rhythm problems, all of these are things that could be affected and improved with 10-day blood sugar programs. 
I did leave this caution in there, although I'm less cautious about this nowadays. Uh, you know, you if you're on insulin, if you're on uh, blood sugar medications, and you start a program like this, just be ready. Keep you should watch your sugars carefully, and keep an eye out because you could notice uh, changes in your blood sugar. And that's not because there's something wrong with the supplements or something wrong with the diet. It means that we're giving you too much medicine. Okay, and so that has to reverse. Usually, insulin goes first. Blood pressure can do the same thing. So the product, um, I, I didn't, I didn't put all the, I didn't put all the dosing. There's several tablets and capsules a day that you take, and it's, again, it's 10 days. It's a lot of supplements for 10 days. You take them, but it works well, and it's, and you broke, it's broken up through the day. After 10 days, people often know, what do I do after that? Well, if you're feeling good and you like what you're doing, you can. Usually, I'll tell people, why don't you do the shake in the morning? Kind of do the shake a little bit in the morning. And there's lots of different recipes you can use with that. Keep going with Diaplex a little bit longer. You know, make sure you got enough trace minerals in the body, all the things that that product replaces from the diabetic. Keep going with that. Try Gymnema for a little while longer. If you're still having cravings and you know sugar cravings, you're still working through that. It takes a couple of weeks to get people off of the sugar cravings and stuff. Maybe continue that. And then keep reading. Don't just take my word for it. Keep looking. I usually, if you follow any of my material, I'm always posting other guys' stuff. Like, hey, don't believe me. Look at this. What this doctor's saying. Look at this doctor's saying. Read. There's tons of stuff out there. How do you work it in with intermediate fast? You What's just, that? If you do an intermediate fasting. So intermittent fasting. We'll briefly touch on intermittent fasting. So you could do this instead of a meal. So if you're doing your fatty coffee, because I know you're doing fatty coffee in the mornings, that's not really a meal. And then you do a shake at lunch instead. And is that when you take your the, the tablets? Is you could. You could take those anytime. Okay. You take All those. at the same time or throughout the day? You should, you know, if it's three to five, but this one, like Diaplex is three to five with meals, so I'd, I'd break it up. Right? The same thing with the other one, the two mm -hmm. before? Yeah, they can all be, and on the, I think she's got some cards. If you're yeah. interested in the details of that, how you take it every day, she's got cards and stuff on that. These are support links. These are things that um, this one link under resources for Energy Tribe here. If you go to Energy Tribe and then go to resources, there's an actual diabetic email link. And there's two reasons. You, if you haven't done that, you need to go look at it. it. You will get a series of emails, one usually one a week, that will basically walk you through what I teach my patients about diabetes. Dr. Gavar and I put that together a couple of years ago, and thousands of people have looked at that. And, and it gives you a lot of the core information that you need. The other reason you might want to do that, if you're serious about this, and I, I'm really excited that you guys are here watching this and listening to this, I have spent my personal time in the recent months writing a, uh, an elimination program for diabetes. So it's like this on steroids, okay? Um, I'm calling it Killing Diabetes for now. At least that's the domain name I bought. <laughs> so, but it is a about uh, eight units, spans about two to three months of videos, talks just like this, that you can do at your own pace, has quizzes and things to help you make sure you understand, action items to help you walk through. And that is not a product right now. That is coming soon. I should have had it done by the end of the year. When that rolls out, if you're on that list, you'll at least be notified so you have an opportunity to look at that material. I feel very passionate about this idea. I, there's so many people in this community, like highest diabetic rate, the state of Texas, highest obesity rate. It's it's a problem here, and people need to be educated that it doesn't have to be. Oh, just make sure you take your medicine. You'll be good. And so people this video told. will be on that website. Yeah. We also have uh, general information about the clinic. The Facebook page for F Future Focus Family Medicine is pretty active. We always put out a lot of information, but it's not always about diabetes. Okay. So uh, just if you're if you're socially active, look at those things. Now I'm going to end there.